Since 1998, Why Islam has grown to become one of the world's leading educational resources on authentic Islam. Why Islam has developed several programs that provide accurate information about Islam while dispelling misconceptions and stereotypes. Over 10,000 hotline calls, 1.3 million annual visits to the Why Islam website, 500,000 likes on Facebook, 100,000 YouTube subscribers, 16.5 million views on YouTube, more than 300 shahadas a year. 20,000 free Qur'ans distributed, 500,000 brochures, information in multiple languages, hundreds of dawah booths and billboards across 50 cities. Tired of hearing stereotypes about Islam? Do your part in fighting Islamophobia. Donate today. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I commence in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I send salutations of prayers and peace upon the finality of prophets and messengers. Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his family, his companions, and all who follow him in righteousness until the day of judgment. Beloved brothers and sisters, today we welcome you to, mashallah, a beautiful fundraising virtual event that we're having here online with you all. We told you to bring, inshallah ta'ala, your cups of coffee. And inshallah ta'ala, we have some amazing speakers who are going to join us, inshallah ta'ala. We have Sheikh Muhammad al-Shanawi. We have our sister, Mindful Muslima, and our sister, Hina Zubaydi, alongside my co-host, brother, or Professor Mustafa Hijazi, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to be discussing living the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inshallah ta'ala. And we've broken this down into four segments, living the legacy according to his uh, a family, living the legacy in conveying the message of Islam, living the legacy with misconceptions, and living the legacy in terms of that ideal role model for men and for women, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Mustafa. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. And brothers and sisters, as you know, this is a rough fundraising Event, inshallah ta'ala, as you saw, mashallah, the beautiful work that is being done by white Islam and continues to be done by white Islam, even more so now that we are in a pandemic, inshallah ta'ala, and amidst COVID, the work has increased. It has not decreased, inshallah ta'ala. You see the ticker down below, inshallah ta'ala, with the donation site. Donate throughout, inshallah, and we'll continue to remind you about that, inshallah ta'ala. Brother Mustafa. Absolutely. Um, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa la. Jazakumullah khair for tuning in. This is a very important event, a very exciting event for us all tonight. Uh, living the legacy of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in following his, foots, his, his uh, footsteps specifically. As uh, my dear brother uh, Imam Abu Sumaya uh, mentioned, we will be uh, discussing uh, the topic of living the legacy in four segments. The first being family, the second being conveying the message, the third being misconceptions, and the fourth being the ideal role model for men and women. This is essentially a coffee house style panel discussion. We will not be in lecture mode, I assure you. We all have our coffees here tonight, alhamdulillah. Um, so it's as if five speakers, inshallah ta'ala, are meeting up to have coffee and to, to discuss very important topics and very relevant topics, of course. Um, as you know, family is integral in our life, so we need to discuss that angle of living the legacy. Conveying the message is an obligation. It's a fard upon uh, the Muslims, as you know, so we need to make sure that Islam is delivered and propagated. Why Islam has been involved in this work for decades upon decades. Uh, please do show your support tonight, and you can do that in many ways. You can do so by obviously uh, donating because donations are crucial for an organization to continue its progress and its work. In addition, you can also volunteer. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of room, brothers and sisters. Volunteer. Get involved in the hotline. Get involved in the dawah boots. We have weekly dawah boots set up across New Jersey and other locations domestically where you can just join us, inshallah. Um, as you know, there are many misconceptions out there, right? A whole lot of misconceptions. And so... With that, we have 24-7 24, 24 hotlines available answering questions from non-Muslims. We have dawah training seminars and webinars that continue even in the midst of the pandemic. Online dawah training, certifications, an upcoming national dawah academy. 
there's a lot to come inshallah ta'ala and a lot being worked on many exciting things to come and of course we'll also be talking about the ideal role model for men and women the prophet sallam was a role model for everyone right he was a mercy for all of mankind rahmatan lil alamin and so with that inshallah bi'ithnillah uh, we can bring in the speakers um, momentarily and then we can proceed with today's uh, session bi'ithnillah so inshallah we are bringing in Sheikh Muhammad al-Shanawi who is the religious director of Masjid Isa ibn Maryam out there in Pennsylvania. Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Thank you for having me. Um, I'm glad you guys didn't give me the boot when you found out I forgot to bring my coffee. But I'm, <laughs> I'm honored to be among you and may Allah make it a blessed beneficial evening for uh, the presenters and the audience alike. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Akhi, if, I mean, Sheikh, if you have a bottle of water, that, oh, inshallah, that could work too. I'll see if I can uh, negotiate that with my family. Okay, see inshallah. We're also going to bring in the sister mindful Muslima, alhamdulillah. And mashallah, she has an ama amazing platform. You can follow her at Mindful Muslim on Instagram, Facebook, and the likes. Asalaamu Alaikum, sister. Yeah, you um, have to unmute yourself. I think you're muted. Yes. <laughs> Oops, sorry. So, alaikum rahmatullah. I said I'm honored to be here with you guys. Mashallah. Pleasure to have you here. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah. Mashallah. So Brother Mustafa, inshallah, I'm going to let you go ahead and open up for us, inshallah, and get us started. Absolutely. Okay, inshallah. So um, the first segment, as um, you all know, as we um, advertised, is in regards to family. Now, as mentioned, family is integral um, in our lives. You know, um, obviously, family is a part of our life. And as the old saying goes, family is treasure. So we want to discuss living the legacy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from a familial perspective, right? Meaning why is family important? How is it important in relation to our deen, to Islam? And how is it tied to the message of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What has Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised us in regards to following his footsteps in this regard, meaning i.e. family? So I'd like to um, initiate this part of the segment with a question, inshallah. We'll start with our uh, dear sister, Mindful Muslima. Uh, inshallah, sister, you're doing well this evening? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Did you bring your coffee or you did know, you pass on that? I did, but I left it on the counter over there. <laughs> I didn't awesome. want to get up and go get it. But maybe if we have a break, I'm going to totally do it. So I want to share a question away if you feel that. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to have to give you a break uh, sometime tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we want to start with the first question. I want to target it to you, Sister uh, Mindful Muslim. I know um, one of your areas is to focus on family and woman issues and, and relevant topics as such. So the first question to you, directed to you, would be, well, in relation to tonight living the legacy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, following his footsteps as mentioned, as aforementioned, is crucial in all aspects of our lives, right? So what are some tips that you can offer for us tonight on how we can actually follow his footsteps in our uh, daily lives when it comes to our family, inshallah. Yeah. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave us Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as um, our greatest teacher and uh, mercy to mankind. So alhamdulillah, I think one of the first things we need to do is we need to know him. And I mean, when you know someone, you know all the intricate parts of their life. So what I think about when I think about this question is many of us were parents. And so I posed this question actually on my platform the other day, and it was kind of like, um, well, you know, how did he parent? How did Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how did he treat children? And many women, they, they couldn't actually rattle down any examples of the Prophet, peace be upon him's interaction with children. And yet all of us think that we're being these uh, great uh, uh, Muslim parents, amazing Muslim parents, like we'd like to be, right? Alhamdulillah. So one of the things that I did is I realized women couldn't actually actively answer that. So I made a challenge, like a five-day challenge for women. And I said, every day I'm going to mention something that the Prophet, peace be upon him, did, and we're going to try to implement it, even if it's just five minutes of our day. So that's what we did. And so we gave this in like small sound bites, opportunities for women to learn about his compassion, about the way he spoke. Like uh, subhanAllah, when we go into um, education as uh, like I'm an educator, we are taught to 
go down on our knee, talk to children eye to eye, you know, speak with them a certain tone. And subhanAllah, thousands and thousands of years before the Prophet, peace be upon him, he did this. He always acknowledged children and he saw they were upset. He never treated them less than adults. There was such a mercy and a compassion in the way he dealt with children. So we try to help women to learn this. And yeah, for sure, mm. even the bits of his parenting or the way he was a spouse, you know, all of these things, I think the more we invest in learning about them, it's, it's right. really going to help. So it, sounds, that. so it sounds to me that um, you're, you're, I guess, um, the pinnacle of, of your tip tonight is in regards to knowing the Prophet Wasallam. So I want to forward this over to Sheikh Shinawi. Um, so Sheikh, how can we know the Prophet Wasallam more in this regard when it comes to family? Hmm. Bismillah. Um, there is actually a, a really good resource that came to mind when, when our sister was speaking. Uh, and it was uh, a book by um, the Syrian scholar, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Salih Al-Munajjid, uh, called Kayf uh, Amalahum. The English translation of the title is How He Treated Them. And from what I hear, the, the English of the translation of the book is very good. And so it classifies relationship by relationship in like uh, widening circles, uh, eccentric circles that expand, uh, how he treated his innermost family member or closest family members and relatives and beyond. And as our sister mentioned, I mean, to, to not love or to love the man or emulate the man that you don't know kind of... Uh, uh, there's something lacking there. There's some inconsistency there or some impossibility there in a sense. And so dedicating ourselves to knowing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an integral part of believing him, is an integral part of emulating him. And it, it's almost uh, too simple to be stated, but we don't want to, to miss out on the fact that it is quite possible that some of our information about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a bit uh, selective, a bit superficial. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that we depend on others to frame for us a certain angle of his life that may or not, may not be accurate and may or may not be complete. And so to be invested in this, in studying the life of the Prophet wasallam, there is really no way for you to understand Islam and the ethical framework of Islam and uh the, the the book of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Quran, without the context of the life through which it was uh, brought to us and shared with us, and so sure, of sure. course the Quran, the Sira, and the that book just came to mind in particular because it's in English and uh, it resonated with me yeah. when she was Shaykh speaking. Yeah, Shaykh 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 Shaykh. It's an excellent resource. Mashallah, Tabarak wa Taala. Um, really quick, I want to introduce our sister Hina Zubaydi, who joined us as well. Mashallah, who is a writer, a writer and editor with. Muslim matters. Salaam alaikum, sister. How are you? Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah khair for having me here. Welcome, sister. Alhamdulillah. Yes. I want to kind of turn the question a little bit and change the question a little bit, inshallah. I want to kind of refocus the question and kind of personalize the question, right? When we're talking about some tips that we can offer following in the footsteps of the Prophet Sallallahu in our daily lives, you know, um, for the three speakers, you know, Imam Shanawi as an Imam, Alhamdulillah, a leader of the community, Mashallah, someone who we know, Mashallah, did a lot of work with the youth in, in, in New York, Mashallah, Mashallah, you know, how can how can you personalize that, right, and then give tips based on your personal life, Mashallah, Mashallah, and what you're currently involved in, so that perhaps individuals who may be in your same circumstance can say, okay, Mashallah, this is how I can follow the prophets of like some of those footsteps, Mashallah. So this is back to me again? Are you guys cornering me? No, no, Mashallah, we're going to... Yeah, are you... I just wanted to interject and kind of just kind of yeah, yeah just give a pointer there and we're gonna move on. Uh, it, it is by um, showing people what it looks like to be a follower of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in today's world, uh, and we will never be able to do that on an individual level. And so maybe we should have a division of labor in the da'wah in general, like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam standing for the oppressed. I am very inspired by what. I, I see in passing. I can't be invested in it 100% the way our sister Hannah Zuberi, for example, is invested in so many of these initiatives to bring awareness to what we're collectively responsible to uh, push back against and advocate for. And what I saw in New York, just to be uh, pointed with the, your question regarding the youth, 
it reminds me of something that you know Ibn al-Qayyim said that most people did not accept the Prophet Muhammad in their life because of the message he brought. Uh, that was like only Abu Bakr because of how sensitive his heart was to truth, right? And then Khadija radiallahu anha also, not many people, even though more than Abu Bakr, but she saw it through his character. This man had to be the truth, right? And she testified to his great character behind closed doors. And then a wider layer of society accepted it through the proofs, uh, which why Islam does, right? The, the proofs and the evidences and the miracles and so on and so forth. But the vast majority of people became Muslim at the end of the story, which is very profound. When they saw on the ground the accomplishments, the work, the fruits of this sacred message, of this wahi, the revelation. And so for us right. to embody, even if partially, segments of that genuinely mm -hmm. is the greatest call you can make to the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So essentially making the proofs and evidences available, which inshallah to uh, live them. And yeah. to live them as well and emulate them. So, um, and this is what we try to do uh, as why Islam as an organization, inshallah. You know, we try to make Dawah boots and informational pamphlets and brochures available to the general public. So please do support us in that regard, inshallah, as you may find the links shown. Um, I want to go, uh, I will uh, go to Sister Hina in just a second, but I had a follow up question for um, Mindful Muslim, real quick. So, um, as Sheikh Shinawi alluded, emulating the Prophet Sallam is also crucial in this regard. But how do you? deal with let's say family members or just general youth and others who may not have that um, motivation or that zeal or enthusiasm to even want to follow the prophet well, that's not an easy one <laughs> no one said it was going to be easy tonight oh man <laughs> I, I really need my coffee now where is it <laughs> um so the thing is first you know there's a lot of issues with uh, a lot of our youth or, or community that's been disconnected and one thing i try to do is i try to first befriend and earn a trust because when you have a good trust and a good relationship if, even if with just the people around you could be like co-workers you know obviously male to male female to female whatever but people in your family um anyone that you think needs that that feeling you try to get close to them you earn their trust and you really let them know that you can be an ear and usually i go in with social problems i i, I like oh how you know there's an issue with the spouse or something like that and i try to give a lot of really great advice that's not my advice it's our dean and i don't mention islam so much but then subhanallah the more and more they say wow where'd you get all these amazing things they're working because islam works then i say oh subhanallah this is our beautiful islam did you know these answers are here the whole while so i kind of go from the side and i try not to approach it head on but at the same time bit by bit to let go so that they can see the beauty of the solutions that are there and for their life subhanallah right so essentially connecting to a person you know and humanizing with them essentially right and being empathetic in a sense um so uh sister hina i'd like to have a follow-up question on this specific subject actually just to follow up here um, so when it comes to difficulties as uh mindful muslim was just mentioning right some difficulties that uh, we encounter uh, what do you see as being some of the common difficulties of taking on this legacy, right? Living the legacy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And, you know, what do we need to surpass in terms of the trials that we may actually encounter? And this could be in relation to our family, the youth, the general community. Uh, alhamdulillah. So I just, one of the things that I would like to say to our audience, especially those who live in the West in the United States, we are so blessed. We have the freedom to pray where we want. We have the freedom to um, give da'wah on the streets. Uh, no one is throwing us into jail or surveilling every move of ours. Yes, there's surveillance at our masajid. Yes, there are people who are trying to infil infiltrate our communities. But we, amongst the Muslims of this ummah, are so blessed. And so when we look at those blessings and we use them to um, continue this legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu You may come and get, uh, there might be some things that you may have difficulty with, but I always, whenever this happens, and yes, there'll be, you know, sometimes in this work, especially in the work of uh, justice or, or shining light on the people, you know, what is happening to our ummah all over the world, um, this is an amana, I feel. And the, some of the difficulties that might come to your way, you may uh, be called a fundamentalist or an Islamist, and you may be called, um, you know, names like that. Or um, you may f face some, sometimes when you're being very open and uh, vocal, uh, it may affect your job or it may affect 
um, what your neighbors think about you. Uh, I remember one time I, uh, I opened up my uh, back door of my car and all of these things like posters and stuff fell out from the back and, you know, boycott China, this Palestine, this, that. And, you know, our, your neighbors take it like a to step back, like what are they doing? Um, but these are very, very little. And this is what I feel like when we face these small difficulties, we need to compare it to the difficulties other Muslims, our brothers and sisters are facing throughout the globe where just naming your child Muhammad is a, a, a crime or growing a beard is a crime or places of going and visiting your place of worship is a crime. And so, when, uh, so whenever those difficulties come, uh, I always feel like we need to uh, look at our blessings uh, first and then say, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the opportunity to talk. I know right now I can say this, I can um, call you to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, call you to the path of the Prophet sallallahu and no one is going to come to my house and pick me up and throw me in jail, right? This is a big amana. This is an opportunity not many Muslims have. So um, yes, there will be difficulties. There are difficulties. I will not say that they aren't. I know of many young people who have been put on lists. Uh, they might not be able to travel. Many of our family members are on the no-fly list and we're not able to travel. Um, but alhamdulillah, uh, you know, our blessings are more than those difficulties. Inshallah. Sure, sure. um Again, donors, uh, brothers and sisters watching, inshallah, don't forget, donate, inshallah, yislam.org, donate. Um, this is a fundraising event, inshallah. Um, in terms of the question, though, inshallah, again, I want to kind of hone it back because oftentimes I feel like we discuss the questions based on the, the, the perspective of looking at what someone else may go, be going through, inshallah. But again, kind of bringing that back home, right, as a parent, as a parent, me, I have my own difficulties with my children. Mm -hmm. I'm living in America, raising my children, inshallah ta'ala. At the same time, I'm an imam. I work for two different organizations. You know, I, I have other side hustles, inshallah ta'ala, that I'm doing to try to maintain my family, inshallah ta'ala. How do we deal with all of these difficulties internally with our own families, right? I would like to maybe if what each of you can kind of give me a, a quick one minute, two minute max, inshallah ta'ala, response of how do we deal with these issues, inshallah ta'ala, as a family man or as a family woman, as a spouse, as a as a as a as a as a father, mother, and child Tala, you know, trying to maintain even our own families in, in the midst of maintaining everyone else's. Sheikh Shana, will you first inshallah? So first first of all, this is gonna require us to conceptualize da'wah as universal. Da'wah is not just to non-Muslims and it's not just to outsiders. The Prophet Sallallahu was commanded with da'wah to those closest first. And so you are more obligated to take care of those near within reach. Uh, my my wife is wife of the year. She got me the coffee, so I'm allowed to stay on the yeah, webinar now. So that's the first issue. Your da'wah, you know, I don't want to get legal here, but there is fardu ayn and fardu kifaya. There's an individual obligation and there is a communal obligation. Da'wah is a communal obligation, meaning in the widest full sense, meaning we the community has to carry it. If they don't carry it, every able person is going to be liable in front of Allah to the extent of their ability. But when you on an individual level have to struggle between or like reconcile, juggle an individual and communal obligation, you should never uh, give up the individual obligation or forego it or neglect it for the communal because the individual means you have to do it no matter what. The communal means it has to get done. Someone has to do it. Uh, so that's the first thing I wanted to say very quickly. The second thing is it really is tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is part of Allah's divine grace to the extent of your sincerity and your eagerness to please him and constantly, you know, do some deep cleaning and, you know, purge all the, the mud of our intentions and our ulterior motives from the crevices. Are you able to reconcile these things? Like if you are truly trying to please Allah, you're not going to fumble priorities, but also Allah will insert that barakah in your life where you're actually able to get more for your buck, if you will, right? More for your hour, more for your dollar. Uh, in that sense, and Allah will not, you know, cause your effort to go to waste with the dearest, closest people to you. This is our expectation. This is the norm. And so sometimes it is a real struggle. So understand your priorities, number one. And number two, ask the tawfiq from Allah. Like if you think about the da'wah of the Prophet Sallallahu they were traveling a lot. They would go off just to battle twice a year to defend Islam from being wiped off the face of the earth. 
And then people are coming to him day and night, and the verses are coming down saying, you know, when you eat, leave. Stop, you know, being such a burden on the Prophet ﷺ. Very yeah. time consuming. But the tawfiq of Allah made sure that nothing bled from the essentials in that process. Mindful Muslim, being, mashallah, having the Instagram page and going out there and doing the lives, mashallah, and, and having babies in the background and the kids in the background and from them not doing the CNN moment and jumping on you, inshallah, inshallah, you know, this is all part of the difficulty, right? <laughs> you know, how do you manage? How do you do it? You know, talk to us. Uh, SubhanAllah. I was thinking about what you said, um, Imam Wesley, about like, I have my wife, I have this, I have that. A lot of us think that when we have to make these relationships all work, that we have to go and address them one by one. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he taught us something very valuable, which is we want to correct all relationships in our life and all situations in our life. The first thing we do is actually correct Ourself between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a lot of women, when I deal with those issues on all those platforms and they're coming to me with all their things, the first thing I ask is, how is your salah? How is your relationship with Allah? How often do you do this? Do you read Quran? Do you have a time in the morning where you connect? And usually like nine out of 10 times, they're like, oh, so not really. So when things are getting rough, we tend to pull away from those things. And that's actually the time we should invest more. So for me, it's grounding myself and reminding myself, like, how good am I with Allah right now? Because if I'm not, how do I expect to be good anywhere else? So just constantly having routines and a time to mm. do that in my life. And finally, uh, Sister Hina, inshallah. You can add on that. So from what I understood of the question, this is, um, I'm going to be maybe a little personal. It's tough. It, it, doing community work is tough. It's tough on your family. Um, the And you really have to keep checking your Nia. Why am I doing this? Is it for, you know, uh, fame? Is it for so people can get to know me and, um, you know, give uh, this uh, pat on my back and say, subhanAllah, yes, mashallah, sister, you're doing so much work. Or is it really for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So personally, on a nafs level, that is one of the diff uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges. Um, uh, and then you, you time. I think time is uh, the biggest uh, um, sacrifice that you have to give in this work. A time that you take away from your family, from your children. And sometimes when your children come up to you and remind you that you sometimes they are not your first priority. And that brings you back on earth. And you're like, oh my God, subhanAllah, what am I doing? You know, I'm doing this for my community, but my own child might be suffering. Um, and at that time, I really encourage community members to lean in, you know, uh, help your community workers out. Check on their kids. Um, you know, I, I know one sister, Sister Zaka in Ohio, you know, her mother was in the hospital. She was doing, you know, filling out grants, doing all this work. And she put a, uh, you know, put a, a, a post out on her Facebook page. And she said, you know, I would love it if someone would deliver food to my house today. I haven't been able to cook for three days because so much work I've been doing. And that was really brave for me to see that, that assist because a lot of times we don't ask for help. We don't say, you know, I need, I need someone to, you know, go run to the grocery store for me. Um, so that is, uh, that is something that is challenging. Um, and, and just mm. giving up friendships, you will, uh, that has been some of my, my, uh, I feel like sacrifice in this, I haven't been able to maintain a lot of those friendships and some of them you outgrow because your goals aren't the same, but some of those like, you know, just the little parties, the ladies parties, the this, that, that perhaps if you weren't so involved in this work, you would have time for, uh, you don't have, you, that, that isn't uh, a priority. So to, to find ways to still connect with your friends um, on, a, on a soul <clears throat> level, you know? So that's what those chants are. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's, that's important. I think that, you know, remembering what and holding on to the rope of Allah, all, all of us together, basically we are one big family and we need to check on each other, inshallah ta'ala, all the time. Um, we're going to go to a short commercial break, inshallah ta'ala. Brother Yasin, inshallah ta'ala, please take us to that commercial break. There are millions of things around me, each with its own purpose. As a human, what is mine? Why am I here? Really, what is my purpose? Do you have an answer? Call now, 877-YISLAM or visit www.yislam.org.
Okay, Jazak Malachet for joining us again. Um, so, um, so dear respected brothers and sisters, I mean, it's very important, as you can see, um, to make Islam available for ourselves, for our community, and for our family members, as the speakers, the esteemed speakers tonight, all implied and explicitly mentioned that we need to start also with ourselves. And in doing so, inshallah, we could do our own research, we could do our own studies and increase uh, intellectually. We're all on an intellectual escalator as we go along. But in addition to that, we also need to do our best to support organizations that are uh, working closely with these initiatives, inshallah. And there's many great organizations out there. Here with Ikna Wai Islam, there's a lot that we do. And uh, in order for the work to continue, inshallah, the support uh, needs to be there, bi ta'ala. And so um, we have donation, donation uh, packages tonight, inshallah, that you all can um, help support. For instance, there's a 5K uh, sponsor uh, sponsorship uh, available where you can actually donate to um, have a Y Islam billboard established. You may have come across these billboards on the highways and um, some locations here in, in New Jersey or your, your locality. But if you haven't, you can certainly search them up online. They um, offer very appealing and intriguing message, messages about the truths of Islam, um, basically providing an intellectual and compassionate case for Islam on a given topic, of course, in relation to misconceptions and uh, theological discourse and many other matters. Um, as you can see there, we have a 1,000 sponsor uh, sponsorship package for the hotline. We have a 24-7 hotline. It runs day and night. Oftentimes when we're, when we're giving dawah um, on the streets or in, at a street fair, for example, or some convention, we will um, have people join or uh, point them to the hotline, inshallah, so they can have further questions uh, answered. You have, for instance, uh, if you want, you can sponsor uh, by providing uh, the package of um, the Y, the Y tube, uh, or rather YouTube uh, ads in relation to $400 there. So $400 would uh, give you a YouTube ad, inshallah. And then we have many other things. So uh, you can actually sponsor an entire Dawah booth. A Dawah booth is $500. So a lot of this is, um, you know, it's achievable. And I would say also, um, you know, it's affordable. I mean, you can also have recurring payments if you like. So all of this is um, as found uh, on the link there, yislam.org slash donate. Please do, do uh, donate generously uh, with Y Islam. And there are many things uh, that you can donate to as alluded. Imam Abu Sumaya, if you want to add, inshallah, you may. Otherwise, we will be going to the next segment very shortly. So we'll move on to the next segment, segment living the legacy, conveying the message, the da'wah. So Sheikh Chanel, inshallah ta'ala, the first question I'm going to pose to you, inshallah, Christians believe that Jesus is the son of God and the Messiah. They also deny the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. How do you feel <clears throat> how do you feel we as Muslims can present the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a manner that appeals to Christian theological discourse? Should there be more of a focus on his message, his character, actions or lifestyle? Mute. Unmute yourself, inshallah, Sheikh. <laughs> uh, my apologies. I was saying, can I check all of the above? Uh, <laughs> you can. Okay, good. But there's no time to explain it, I guess. So <laughs> what, one of the things that comes to mind here is that, you know, the, the very well-known uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes, who was, a, uh, who was a minister himself, he says that one of the biggest things that delayed his coming to Islam was the fact that he felt like he was betraying Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He says, till it finally clicked, right? Allah opened his heart to understanding it from the proper angle, which is that I became, as he puts it, a better Christian when I became Muslim, meaning I became more aligned with Jesus now because the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings, didn't come to destroy the message, but to complete the perfect building. Uh, as he himself said, I am that final brick and I am the seal of the prophets. So th that is important to clarify to people that. Also, what the Muslims did when they went to Abyssinia or Ethiopia, when they went to an, uh, Al Habasha, they began with the common ground. And this was not like a, an arbitrary judgment call, or it wasn't just like his, uh, the bright idea of Jafar, or the Muslims, when they recited Surah Maryam, the chapter of Maryam, to uh, that audience. You begin with the common ground always. I mean, didn't the Quran say to say to them, Our Lord and your Lord is one? Even sometimes Muslims may feel this reservation because there is, we believe, there is some contention. There is some shirk involved, right? There is some polytheistic uh, elements involved elements in, in, in other faiths. And so we shouldn't say that we worship the same God. No, we absolutely do worship the same God. Um, but the issue is that who worships that God exclusively? 
And so what I mean is we can start there. We do worship the same God. Or the other verse that says, you know, come to a common word between us and you. To not worship except the one true God. So ah, beginning yeah. with the commonality uh, is extremely important to re reinforce the fact that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did not come uh, to destroy the message, but rather to restore it. And just to close out, you know, Yusuf Estes himself, I remember ages ago, I haven't subhanAllah, heard him and I pray he's well and Allah bless his health. But I remember he used to say that now when I define Islam to people, I define it with a prayer I used to make as a Christian called the Lord's Prayer, which mm. is, you know, thou, our Father thou art in heaven, give us today our daily bread. Thy kingdom come, thy will be, your, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. He said, that's Islam to me. You know, the, God's will is done everywhere you know, in the heavens, in the cosmos, and there's a little bit left uh, for us. What are we going to do with our agency? Are we going to submit it to God or not? That's exactly what Islam is all about. That framing is very wise, and we are commanded in Islam to call with hikmah, right? To place the words in their proper places. So in the Christian context, and even if this is a post-Christian America, still those underpinnings, those undertones are there in society. So we must be wise okay. and use that. That's kind of why I called my masjid, Masjid Isa ibn Maryam. It's an excellent yeah. conversation. Started. Beautiful name. Beautiful and by, name. I mean, I did steal it from other masajid. I just love the idea. <laughs> oh, I thought it was it authentic, has... Sheikh. No, no, nothing. I'm... <laughs> All about well, plagiarism, um, I do want to comment on this. Um, you know, one the people who we interact the most um, on the Dawah field really are Christians. And um, this is very interesting because, you know, we live in a time where there's a growing rise of atheism and godlessness. But it, it's really interesting that uh, most who we encounter today are still um, following uh, Christianity. And so I think uh, your point really hits home for many, uh, inshallah, many viewers. Um, on, on Why Islam here, we also have a lot of viewers who are Christians. So it's it's very nice to um, interact with them in that sense. And I think, you you know, you pretty much check, checked off all of the above uh, in terms of message, character, actions, and lifestyle in um, your statement. But what one hadith that comes to mind also is, you know, where the Prophet ﷺ said that both in this world and hereafter, I am the nearest um, of all the people to, to Jesus, uh, the son of Mary. The prophets are paternal brothers, right? And their mothers are different, but the religion, the deen is one. And so they all came with the purpose and the message of Islamic monotheism. And I think as long as, like you mentioned, you know, just to echo you, as long as you draw that commonality and you can show that, commona that commonality theologically, philosophically, scripturally right i mean the scriptures are very clear too right matthew 5 17 uh jesus said you know he did not come to break the law of the prophets but he came to fulfill them and many other uh commonalities that you can draw forward here but i'll push this uh back to you in terms of um now because you mentioned Dao, right and and again why islam is about mashallah an organization of giving Dao. we'll talk we're going down we're talking to non-muslims and then those non-muslims are the ones who are becoming inshallah ta'ala muslims don't forget to donate why islam.org forward slash donate sister um mindful muslim inshallah ta'ala in terms of dealing with the converts as a convert you yourself inshallah ta'ala you know what advice would you would you give inshallah ta'ala because i know that it is different with every person right dealing with your family members for instance i came into islam and i came with the bible in one hand i came with the quran in the other hand and i thought i was going to save my entire family and everybody was like whoa where did this crazy guy come from you know what are you doing calm down slow down buddy right so what advice you dealing with converts you know what advice would you give to these new muslims maybe who are out there sharing the message people who want to go out and share the message with their non-muslim family members inshallah ta'ala and how to approach them that um, uh, first, I'll say, uh, you know, it's funny, Sheikh Muhammad Shinway, he, he mentioned uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. I actually uh, made shahada with him, alhamdulillah, oh, back in 2003. Um, amazing, oh, mashallah. Amazing. That's news to me, too. I had no idea. Yeah, he sat with me oh. for hours. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless wow. him. He missed his whole speech at a masjid, and everybody so, was just not. Can, can we just ask you before, you before we move on? Can we just ask you? I mean, what was um, the point that really hit home for you that made you make that decision? All right, you know, Sheikh Yusuf Estes makes sense. You know, this makes sense. This is the truth. Um, you know, it's funny because I was an avid reader of the Bible. I was a bit dorkish. I used to read like six hours a day because I was like, it's the book of God. What else would I read? A magazine, you know? So I would read it, read it, and I knew it, but no Muslim at the time. who were supposed to know our own book and the other books, but they didn't that much. You know, they didn't know them. And I had a laundry list. So I was like, I want to know the entire difference between Christianity and Islam with the prophets. The prophets, all the list of them, I need to understand the stories. He sat with me for three hours until they were all done. And then he's like, you done now? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's it. I just needed someone to clarify. Thank you so much. Oh, that sounds like Sheikh Yusuf, though. 
Yeah, and you're laughing the whole time. You don't have your back. Yeah. To, uh, to answer your question, um, honestly, it's first to know the dean yourself because what I try to tell a lot of converts, reverts, is know the difference between Islam and culture. Unfortunately, we Muslims, we confuse them a lot with our own bits and pieces from our, our families. And so you become really passionate when you understand what is clearly from Islam. I just want to mention one resource when uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Shinui was talking about resources of knowing the Prophet. Do you know what I did? The first book or set of books that I read before the Quran was the Oldie but Goodie, uh, Riyadh Salihin. When I read Riyad Salihin, I was so confused. I would see women outside, we're not supposed to be loud. They're cackling and loud. We're not supposed to wear these big makeup and jewelry. They're doing that. Everything I was like, what? This doesn't, you know what? What did the prophet do? How did he do every single thing? Let me just study that. I can't go wrong. So I, I read both of the, 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 the volumes and alhamdulillah, I said, now I know. This makes total sense to me everywhere I went. So know your deen, get that the religion, not the culture from your friends and all those things that they do. And alhamdulillah, then you can speak with confidence. And when your family says things, it doesn't hurt as much because, you know, they just don't understand. And I, and I understand who I am and you don't get frazzled. But if you don't know your deen and you don't know your position, then it can affect you a little. So I would just suggest that. No. Sister Hannah, inshallah, Tala, uh, I want to switch it up a bit, inshallah. What does the role uh, or what role does the media play in conveying the message of Islam and reminding Muslims of our purpose? How can we use social media, the internet, and everything else connected to that responsibly for the purpose of that? Hello, great question. You know, it's a tool. And just like any other tool out there, you have to use it wisely. You have to make sure you know the pros and cons and sort of read the manual before you get on there. Um, I, it, the social, you know, a lot of times, especially as we're talking to our children, we talk about social media, the pitfalls of social media. But honestly, a lot of the most amazing people that I've met in my life, some of my closest friends have been because of social media, getting together with these writers all across the world who took up their pens and write on a consistent basis for years, representing the thoughts of normative Islam uh, at a time when not a ma not many people were doing this. Uh, and so, and that's how Muslim Matters was formed, uh, because we saw that a lot of uh, there were progressives, uh, you know, quote unquote, and other uh, point of views out there for Muslims, um, but no one really talking about what normal normative Muslims um, thought and how they worship. So that was something. What else I'm seeing, and I, I really, uh, I'm really glad for this trend, is that a lot of now Muslims are sending their children to study journalism, to write for mainstream newspapers. So um, this is really important. We need people who can write with nuance, who are not framing us in this very Orientalist way. Um, but this also the community also, just like we're uh, talking about, you know, like giving dawah. These are these are all. Um, these pamphlets, they don't get just made by themselves. These shows that why Islam's uh, phone channel, you know, these are not, they're not going to just happen themselves. Community has to invest in Muslim media, in sending Muslims to write for non-Muslim media, all of that. So I think that is something that is extremely important. We do have a role. Um, this, you know, uh, it's made... Uh, Twitter and Facebook and all the Instagram, all of these platforms have made it democratic. You can get up there. Anybody can get up there, right? So as long as we get up there and use it wisely, knowing that this is also being written down uh, in our book of deeds, and it's not just what we say with our mouth, but what else, also what we write out. Uh, so inshallah, this is an amazing platform and amazing tool. And mashallah, I wanted to use that as well to mention that alhamdulillah, that has been one of the most important things for us now at Y Islam. Alhamdulillah, that we have used social media to basically be the conduit with us and the non Muslims and the new Muslims, right? And the Muslims in general, inshallah, ta'ala, especially when COVID first hit really hard. We had to come up with creative ways, inshallah, ta'ala. We weren't able to hit the streets and we had to come up with creative ways on how to get online, you know, teach Dawa courses. You know, Brother Muslim from Mashallah filled out. He became creative on how to go ahead and create a discourse online using the social media platforms, inshallah ta'ala. And alhamdulillah, we've been busy with that. We even, mashallah, um, during the pandemic, did a conference in Spanish. So mashallah, globally, mashallah, we had over 300 attendees globally from about maybe 35 different countries, mashallah, right, mashallah. attending. So mashallah, this is what you are donating to. This is what you're investing in, inshallah ta'ala. This is mashallah. 
uh, a retirement fund every time you give to, do uh, to donate to white Islam. This is a retirement fund that you are placing your donations in, inshallah ta'ala. So when we meet Allah ta'ala, ta that mashallah, all of these things have been building up over the years, even when you're gone in Sadaqah Tajariya. So don't forget, inshallah, please donate to whyislam.org forward slash donate, inshallah. Sister Muslima, I'm going to change it up again real quick um, with another question. Your name has interesting implications, mashallah, that one may derive. In what sense would you say being a mindful Muslim or Muslima entails in regards to having a sense of importance to a doubt? Um, this is Rahim. So first of all, I want to say I'm not I'm not declaring that I am a mindful <laughs> Muslim as the uh, because that would be quite arrogant. Astaghfirullah. Uh, what I'm trying to do instead, honestly, is I'm trying to uh, create a movement, more like a movement for women, um, with with them just reconnecting with themselves and reconnecting with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Because our women are going through a lot. They're going through a lot, and I think sometimes we're groping, almost like groping in the dark for answers. And if we keep looking outside of ourselves and outside of our Dean for all the answers and all these gurus and everything all over, like you know. Facebook and YouTube and whatnot, um, we're going to miss a lot of the time for reflection. So this idea with the strong emphasis on muraqaba, on this mindfulness and the awareness of everything we're doing, taking time, slowing down, Social media has us busy, right? We're scrolling the phone, uh, scrolling TikTok. I would be like, hopefully not, right? You know, all these different things are all over the place and our brains are busy. And when do we have time to stop and hear the voices in our head, connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So just being really mindful about our speech, our actions, slowing down, connecting. And this is a really great thing that uh, we're encouraged to do in our deen. And I encourage women in a movement into this as opposed to just like going along with the, everything that's going on. Yeah. And you know, unfortunately, I think this is where the issue is. Um, oftentimes uh, modern day you know in our in our muslim communities is is being mindful right is to have god consciousness essentially which is taqwa right and so a question to us all and really this is this could be introspection for even us right is how can we be more mindful right what are some things that we can do what are some things that we can be involved in what are some thoughts that we can keep reflecting on that would essentially keep us uh, mindful of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Right, as we know, that it's truly with the remembrance of Allah that we may truly find rest. But um, in order to acquire that um, internal, uh, spiritual, metaphysical rest, what do we need to do? Uh, I think this is just a question for us all. I'll throw it out on the table, inshallah. Whoever wants to pick it up. So I'll jump in very quickly. I was actually uh, asked this question by uh, by Rutgers uh, members of the Rutgers MSA on a webinar two nights ago. How do we become more mindful and is it permissible to meditate in Islam? Uh, uh, and, I mean, uh, meditation, is, meditation is fine. Lot, yeah. I'm sorry, go again? No, I said people ask that a lot. So please yeah. do go ahead and address and, that. And, and this speaks to the need, right? This speaks to people feeling like they are a shell of themselves. Uh, True. That something is off. And there's nothing wrong with meditation so long as the the mode or the form the modality is is permissible doesn't involve an intoxicant or doesn't involve you know whatever it is or squandering religious duties or using uh, whatever would be unlawful in islam but the but the idea that what sprung that question was me actually taking a jab at at thanksgiving i don't have a personal islamic problem with thanksgiving per se but i was just speaking about the reductionism of modern culture when you try to reduce mm. something as central uh to your psyche as the gratitude to a day a year you will not get it even on that day a year and that's why it's very interesting that in thanksgiving it's it's become a, a cultural uh phenomena that we overeat and we over shop on a day when we're supposed to be grateful for what we have right it's the the counter intuitiveness there is, is pretty uh glaring and so the, the issue is how do you do this the right way and i told them sure fine you want to you want to meditate but the fact that Allah told us to eat mindfully, to speak mindfully, to stop five times a day regularly, that, that, is, that is very significant because you will fall apart if you defer your meals to the end of the week. And so the assumption that you will not fall apart if you don't stop and have your spiritual meals five times a day uh, has grave ramifications. And so you will not find a better uh, form or... Uh, incubator that's a bad word in the COVID era right uh <laughs> an incubator for mindfulness than what islam already put for you right like moments of seclusion with yourself and allah before sunrise and sunset the five daily prayers with with ihsan right with perfectionism 
or, or excellence. The framework is already there. Like, I don't even want to tell you, make sure you have three days a week of, you know, the exercise of how to stop thinking, how to interrupt thoughts so that you can have memory restoration and all these, you know, um, theories on, you know, uh, mental health rehab. You have your, pr the fact that you are supposed to sit down when you're eating, the fact that you're supposed to say Bismillah before and ham, that requires mindfulness. The, the, the psychological and the spiritual and the emotional benefits in that are known by those who exert an effort to observe it and inculcate it into their lives. You know, even though, Sheikh, uh, some may say that they're being grateful for, mashallah, the discounts on Black Friday, inshallah, you know. <laughs> I'm not against getting a discount on Black Friday or donating to Islam on Giving Tuesday. Hey, inshallah, inshallah. <laughs> really quick, though, you mentioned that, uh, and I'm curious if anybody at that event brought up along with being mindful, mind-shifting, because it seems like this is something new as well. Oh no, I don't know what mind shifting is. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like um, maybe we haven't been, um, we haven't taken the time to transmit our traditions to the next generation if these questions are being asked. You know, that means we haven't talked about tadabbur enough. We haven't talked about tazkiyah enough. We haven't talked about muraqabah enough. This is, this. these are all part of our traditions, a part of Islam. And so when uh, you get, a, you know, the Calm app or, you, you know, a lot of like mindfulness or med meditation becomes... Uh, trending on Twitter or Instagram, that's when our young people are realizing, oh, this is something that is beneficial for your mental health or your psychological, so, uh, so, um, physical or um, spiritual health. So I feel like this is something that we, this is, the onus is on us. Maybe we talk about fiqh too much, you know, gave so much importance on fiqh and aqidah, and, which is absolutely important and left that um, vacuum uh, you know, in that regard. So uh, I really urge any one of you, any one of you doing any sort of work, whether any human being, that you need to have a daily, um, where the daily vicar schedule from the sun, right? Not something that uh, some you picked up on some website. Uh, it's very important to have accountability of yourself. And when you sit down and do that accountability, any, you know, during like at the misnoon time that the, uh, that, uh, the Imam talked about, or a time where you feel like, okay, before going to sleep, I need to take accountability of my day. That is all meditation. That's all mindfulness. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, from our tradition. And, and I'm not sure with you guys, and maybe really quick, you know, you can elaborate really quick. Um, personally, um, with the work that we have at YSM, um, I have seen a growing, right, in the positive direction so growing number of people being more mindful, especially now during COVID, right? COVID has brought about, mashallah, a, a new mentality. Maybe this is one of the good things that COVID brought forth, that now people are trying to be more conscious of their Lord. They're trying to be more conscious of their Lord, more conscious of their prayer, um, more conscious regarding life and death. Has this something that you have also been going within your community and anybody can feel free to jump in? I wanted to echo with this sister, I agree. It's something that we do need to come back because what happens is it is trending everywhere else. And then the questions that I constantly get asked by women for like, is that permissible? What does Islam say about this? I'm like, but Islam had it all the while, you see? So we have to kind of come back and be like, okay, but this is, let me tell you what women want to know and, 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 and men want to know too, but I, I mostly obviously speak to women. Um, they want to know how. Okay, so like if I was going to be mindful, like what would that look like? So then I have to go ahead and like show them, well, morning routine, it might look like this. So if you made a schedule, they want the actual literal how to because many of them like, so I think it, it behooves us not to start create these resources out there that lead our people back to how in the Islamic sense. And I think it's really, really something they're craving because they start to see the benefit. And yes, with COVID, like not all gifts come wrapped in a bow. I think that's made us all look at ourselves when we don't want to sometimes and then go, okay, so how do I deal with those feelings? And that's a whole nother experience. So, Inshallah, we want to remind everybody, Inshallah, please feel free to ask any questions regarding the segments that have been going on so far. Um, we ask that any questions that are asked, Inshallah, that they be related to segments, Inshallah, um, and so we can go ahead and share those questions um, throughout segments to the panelists, Inshallah. Um, we're going to take another commercial break, Inshallah.
Talib, Brother Yasin, if you can go ahead and bring us to another commercial break, please. There are millions of things around me, each with its own purpose. As a human, what is mine? Why am I here? Really, what is my purpose? Do you have an answer? Call now, 877-YISLAM, or visit www.yislam.org. Inshallah. Uh, Yasin, you want to go ahead and share the word with us, Inshallah? Um, this is what I was talking about. So, inshallah, ta'ala, we are coming towards our third segment, inshallah. Ta'ala. We wanted to remind everybody, inshallah, ta'ala, you've seen, alhamdulillah, um, that white Islam is extremely active, brothers and sisters, inshallah. Ta'ala. You know, we have the different levels that Brother Mustafa and Jassi have already mentioned in terms of donating, inshallah. Ta'ala. Um, I wanted to remind you, as the National Hispanic Director as well, alhamdulillah, we have a very, very active Hispanic department. We have a large task in our hands. We know that the Latinos are the largest, largest inshallah, my, uh, minority um, ethnic group entering the fold of Islam, alhamdulillah. And mashallah, we are very busy, mashallah, across country. Forget about just the United States. We're busy in the United States, alhamdulillah. We have the 800 number, 877 number. We're people are calling in and asking questions. We have numbers in Mexico, inshallah, ta'ala. We're delivering classes, you know, across the country for different people because, mashallah, they don't have resources that we may have here in the Americas, inshallah, ta'ala. As well, mashallah, we are actively putting out billboards, not only billboards, but we have actually bus stop as that are, are being done in South Tala, so that some of the most, mashallah, um, you know, business areas, we just did bus stop at in Union City, um, right before you enter New York City, you have thousands of pounds, thousands of people coming off and getting out of the bus at that point coming up, and you see the beautiful wife, I'm at it, shallow South asking people to call and donate, or asking people to call the wife, some numbers in terms of, if they have any questions or need any information, inshallah, as well, mashallah, we have dawah packages that are going out all of the time, mashallah. People are always calling in, organizations are always calling in, asking us to go ahead and send packages, inshallah, so that we continue to give the message of Islam. So when you're, mashallah, investing your funds, this is what you're investing your funds in, inshallah, you're investing your funds in resources, physical resources, you're investing funds in human resources, are going out to do that work for you, inshallah, and as the Prophet of Allah said, the one who leads someone to good will get the same reward as the one who does that good. So if you can only imagine, mashallah, the people who have taken shahada because of the how packages that are given away, the people that take shahada because of the Qur'ans that are given away. This is another, mashallah, donation that you can give. If you donate $50, mashallah, you sponsor you know, 25 Qur'an. If you donate $100, you sponsor 50 Qur'an. If you donate $500, you sponsor 250 Qur'an. And mashallah, these are being given out all of the time. And people often say, after they receive this book, mashallah, they call the hotline number, they say, read the Qur'an, alhamdulillah, I want to take shahad. I want to be a Muslim. I believe what's in the Qur'an. And mashallah, it could have been your doubt that that was you for inshallah. And you never know where that can go. I always, and I don't like to give myself as an example, because I'm probably worse with examples, especially amongst, mashallah, all of the beautiful speakers that are here with me. But mashallah, 23 years old, someone dedicated just a little bit of time to call me to Islam, alhamdulillah. And mashallah, I became a Muslim, alhamdulillah. And this individual who called me to Islam for 20 years, I have not seen this person. I don't know if he's alive, may Allah have mercy on him. I don't know what's his status, I'm Rabbi Adim. But subhanAllah, everything that I have done in my life that I ask Allah to accept from me in terms of some kids on Umrah, you know what I mean, doing Dawah with Islam, helping to establish one of the first masjids um, in our era and time, the Latino Muslims, all of this subhanAllah goes on that brother's scale and he is rewarded, right? So the work that we do here is an investment. It's better than Roth, it's better than 401k, it's better than any other investment plan that you can invest in. It is residual income with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, mashallah, you will definitely receive back, inshallah. So, yislam.org, or slash donate, inshallah. We also have people online. If you want to call in and make that donation, 1877 Y Islam. We have 
live, people ready to pick up your phone call and shout out and make the donation process that much easier for you. But most of take it away. Inshallah. Um, I think we can go for another Q, inshallah. Absolutely. Brother Yassim. Do you feel like American Muslims don't contribute to society? Are Muslims a threat to America? Did you know that Muslims have always been an essential part of America? Morocco was the first country to recognize the United States in 1777. 20% of slaves were Muslim. Thomas Jefferson had the first White House Ramadan dinner in 1805. Muslims fought alongside George Washington against the British. 10% of all physicians in America are Muslims. Over 7,000 Muslims serve in the armed forces. In 2016, in New York City alone, Muslims owned an estimated 95,816 small businesses and created 176,744 jobs. Don't believe the fake news. Get the facts. Call 877-Y-Islam today. You deserve to know. Okay, alhamdulillah, that was an excellent commercial and honestly one that really feeds to our next discussion, which is on misconceptions. So as you guys know, um, misconceptions are still out there about Islam. Um, the, the religion continues to be uh, hijacked and misconstrued to the general public. And for this reason, it's very important that we demonstrate an accurate and compassionate and intellectual case for Islam to the wider community. So, unfortunately, there's ongoing talk and discussion, um, discussions by critics and orientalists and Islamophobes and many others who perceive Islam as barbaric, as backwards, as alien, right, as something that doesn't belong in the West. And with that, um, most of the attacks I have seen, at least uh, from a Dawah perspective or field Dawah perspective, have to do with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself his lifestyle, and basically um, maybe his marriages, and maybe um, his specific actions, and so on and so on, referring to hadith sources and what have you. So in order for us to rid of such misconceptions and to teach and educate the mass about the true, authentic, original, orthodoxy message of what Islam is, and, and, and the seerah and the, the biography of Prophet Muhammad we need to make sure and we need to ensure that we make uh, such informational pamphlets on those topics uh, available on a large scale. You can imagine um, the amount of resources that would be involved here and the amount of support that would be involved to do such thing. Uh, so again, we, we ask you all, inshallah, to help and to donate uh, this initiative. Any funds that you apply are fully applied for the purpose of Dawah um, to print these brochures and messages on all those various topics, inshallah. So we want to get into the first question. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, Sheikh Janawi, you already know what's coming. But basically, uh, I can't get over that video that went viral some time back, some years back. Um, it was all over YouTube, Facebook. I think it was on one path. Um, you know, it really caught fire. And basically in that video, you had mentioned um, of a you spoke of a professor from New York City, right? You left out his name, and this individual, this professor, left atheism for Islam, subhanAllah. And he did so after reading the works of Muhammad Iqbal, rahimahullah, the Muslim uh, theologian. And he quoted his statement specifically where Iqbal said, "Sure, you can deny God, but how do you deny Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam?" Now, of course, considering that Islamophobes and critics and Orientalists uh, constantly attack Muhammad uh, and his lifestyle and so on, can you, from that angle, expand on the profound message of that statement and how it relates to living legacy of Muhammad and also how, how we can demonstrate the true and authentic message of Muhammad and who he was, who he truly was? That's way too much for two minutes, but uh, go for it. Do your best. I, I really just like totally disabled all the thoughts I had lined up every time you added the question. I was like, I forget it. I tend to do that often. Let me act like there's an internet connection issue and sign out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm notorious for that. So, in all honesty, uh, 
you know, as I always quote Nursi as saying, you know, one of the great forefathers of like modern Turkish Islamic reform, we are more in need of building what's absent than destroying what's present. And in this regard, that means, you know, spreading more correct information about Islam and the Prophet in particular, uh, for your question, the Prophet in particular, then responding to the doubts. You know, actually, uh, let me personalize this because people don't want to. Sister Hezuberi is going to deny this, but it's true. <laughs> that years ago, uh, I was responding to something that was trending. Uh, it was a social justice issue of sorts, has to do with gender theory. And she was, uh, alhamdulillah, she was the editor and filter for the paper. And he said, Sheikh, just brace yourself and please like to take this with a grain of salt. I don't know if she remembers. And she just totally roasted me. Okay. <laughs> she said to me, Why are all the Imams checking out of the uh, project, as she actually mentioned earlier, of making sure there is no fumble in our very rich, very complete tradition and just getting on to the other issue? And I don't know, maybe it's the juiciness of controversy. I can't really, you know, absolve myself if I had a clear intention. Maybe it's just my, my immaturity, like the impatience of thinking there's a quick fix to so all these ideologies that are hijacking our community. I don't know what it was. But yes, I was. And ever since that day, she doesn't know this. I've said story a thousand times to people. It's just, it has very totally solidified for me where I want to be my Dawah. Uh -huh. That there has to be like a division of labor and there has to be some people that are almost, obviously not irrelevant, but almost you know, blinding themselves from the passing incidentals, the objections here and, you know, controversies there, and just focus on the timeless fundamentals. What is the reality of our deen? What is the reality of our Prophet Sallallahu And there is no shortcut, so that's actually what really works. You know, this is the only way to build immunity for the Muslim and appeal for the non-Muslim to see Islam. And, and it takes a whole lot of effort because, as you mentioned a second ago, the odds are enormous. Like, if you want to look up Fear, Inc. and all these, you know, thorough studies about the campaigns to demonize Islam and, like, foster fear, the fear-mongering that happens, hundreds of millions of dollars are invested in this regard. And that is what makes a clip like that, sadly, or part of makes a clip like that so groundbreaking. You know, like, oh, my God, the Prophet Muhammad changed the world. Yes, of course he changed the world. Anyone who knows the facts, there's, there's like, such a, a disparity between first and second base. Nobody came close to the influence, never, let alone being a positive influence on the planet, like the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. So the amount of effort to swipe that out of sight and get the world to overlook and not appreciate how starkly unique, blessed, necessarily divine his project was, shows you how much effort we need to put in uh, to make sure that is not uh, dismissed. Absolutely. Quick question. I want to ask Sister Hannah because you mentioned something, Sheikh Shinawi, in terms of the millions that are invested in fear mongering, right? And I find that in terms of the Muslim community, we have yet to reach the pinnacle and the height of the understanding that we need to invest in similar things, right? In, in terms of media and, and, and content and creation, all these different things. What is your opinion in terms of that, Sister Hannah, especially, mashallah, with the with you guys going get on Muslim matters? Do you think, mashallah, if we invested more in these type of things, alhamdulillah, we can, mashallah, begin to combat um, what needs to be combated? And how difficult has that been for you guys? Definitely. I, I really, truly believe that um, Muslim media needs to be supported. And I'm not just saying just for the platform we do. Currently, there is, I believe, only one Muslim newspaper in this entire country. That is terrible. That's, that statistic is uh, just, the, you know, so many small newspapers have just shut down. These were papers that gave our, not only covered our history, but, uh, you know, 100 years from now, if people read the history of Muslim in the United States, they won't have first, you know, first, uh, what are they called, uh, First term resources, I'm uh, blanking out on that right, term, right. but we won't have that. It'll all be secondhand, not first hand resources versus second hand resources. So these are this is it's extremely, extremely important for us to invest in our own narratives and to be careful of where we're putting our money because a lot I feel I see a lot of money being invested, but then the same folks are then on extremely uh, problematic platforms, uh, taking up uh, pretending or 
uh, maybe their niya is good that they want to represent Islam there, but if your platform is such that it's going to take people away from Islam the minute they step away from your little column, what is the point of being on that platform? But more than that, one thing that I have learned uh, in, you know, subhanAllah, I'm sure we just have a look at for sharing that. That made me <laughs> I can now step away and have like a little bit of cry out there. Chanel is but, really uh, good at that, by the way. <laughs> MashaAllah. <laughs> um, one of the things that in, as in my maturity too, you know, like we when we start off, like we're at a different stage in our life and then you come to it, you know, it's been doing this more than a decade. One thing that I've learned, uh, I never thought I'd be sitting on the same table with some of these Islamophobes. I used to think it was a waste of time. It was a waste, you know, why would I be, uh, even, even uh, a lot of my work recently has been at the Capitol. Uh, I remember the first time I walked into Tred Ted Cruz's office, I was like reciting the Ayatollah Kursi like, <laughs> so now, like over and over again. But um, uh, one round, like for, for example, I'm sitting on this round table right now called the Inatural Religious Freedom Round Table. And there are many, many people I recognize that this person called XYZ, you know, uh, said something horrible about them, or th that person uh, turned our work and called us all these names. And But now when we're sitting there, and for example, right now we're working on what is happening to Muslims and Christians in India under the Hindutva ideology. So the, 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 the platform is the same, right? The, the, the point, the issue that we're working on is the same. And being able to be our authentic, true, our Muslim selves and be, you know, with our, all our Islam, with the entire prophethood, with, the, with the, everything that's problematic to these people. Yeah. And still being on the same table with them because now here we have a common enemy. I don't think I would have done that three or four, five years ago. But now I'm realizing how important it is because we've been missing on those spaces. There are people who are not severe to Islam who are at that table and and sort of divert, you know, uh, make them stronger in their attacks against mm. us. How are you going to attack me when you yesterday were sitting on the table talking to me about third enemy, right? Mm. So this is something that I feel like yeah. in my uh, yeah, a majority. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely bit. inconsistent. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Strahan. Now, as we're uh, going on with this segment of the program, mm -hmm. what comes to mind is how many misconceptions are really out there and uh, the fact that dispelling them is crucial. And so we need to be involved in dispelling this and support organizations that do so. So again, just a reminder, please support the organization, brothers and sisters, and donate to the best of your ability. And, you know, really what comes to mind um, in addition to that is I'm thinking about the non-Muslims that are seeing our program right now advertised and running live and they're looking and they're living the legacy. They're looking and they're seeing, living the legacy of the Prophet. And to them, you know, what comes to mind probably is, the Billah, you know, uh, this pedophile, this such and such person, and they, they bash the Prophet Sallallahu So, and one of the things that they like to target, for example, in marriages of the Prophet Sallallahu his marriage to Aisha, you know, the marriage of Aisha issue uh, comes um, more often than I would say, uh, it, it, you know, any any Muslim would like to know of. I mean, it's just extremely common. Um, a lot of my debates, um, you could say, with critics, have to do with that issue. What's really easy to resolve. It's a fallacy of presentism, you know, taking things, that, looking at things anachronistically. Very easy to deal with. But I want to I wanna bring this to mind for some of it because she deals a lot with, like, the social kind of um, aspect of things when it comes to our Muslim community. So how how can we um, help our youth? And this is a very important, very important question. Our youth, sisters, who may be vulnerable, maybe exposed to such misconceptions, and then see, oh, look, um, our process is being thought of as this by my friend or by my colleague, or I heard this about the prophet. And it may, uh, you know, some Muslims, some Shubhahad may be introduced to them. So what can we do as leaders, for instance, how can we be involved to help rid of these misconceptions and preserve the overall deen and uh, spirituality of, of our brothers and sisters? 
a really good question. And um, inshallah, I'm going to start based on uh, with the sister with the last point that she made about us being at the table. And you know, it's really funny. Uh, maybe about a year and a half ago, I didn't actually have Instagram. I didn't have Facebook, and I didn't. I wasn't on YouTube. The only reason I literally Allahu Alam Nia took him on was to create a sense of balance because I saw so many women, like like she said, like representing us that weren't necessarily like you know completely representing us. And so I was like, gosh, I need to like. You know, there ha somebody has to speak our narrative, and so I came on. But one thing I noticed is, like, yeah, these things are coming down the pipeline. So what I try to do, and what I suggest to other daddies, like, wherever the people are, go there. Like, I was not on Instagram, but I had to go there. And when I went there, I would open up, and I would have polls, and I would say, you know, what's bothering you today? What's troubling you today? What's an issue you have with this? I would just literally ask them, and I would take all their feedback, and then I would basically go, and that's what I would post, and that's what I would do a video on. And that's, like, I just naturally – I remember – I always taught like the prophet peace be upon him he would go even if he was going to the member with specific speech if he noticed something was happening right there in front of his eyes he would change the speech and he would speak directly to it and say some people think this is such and such an idea and 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 he'd do it because it needed to be addressed and i think we too need to do that whether you have to put yourself in places you you've never been not so comfortable or ask about what the, you know our people need to hear or muslims or Muslims. i ask and then they tell me and that's what I try to put out. Alhamdulillah. I want to carry it over to Sheikh Shinawi. Um, she has, you know, you know, it's very common for these Orientalists and critics to demonize Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what are some, pro some approaches that come to your mind, you know, that can be taken from a Dawah perspective on um, how to destroy the, to, the true and authentic legacy of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to such antagonists? I mean, on, on the discourse level, um, reframing the conversation uh, is always healthy. And it is Quranic to do that as well, and not to uh, overemphasize, but I don't think there is an overemphasis on my earlier point of building what is absent. You know, some people, uh, <clears throat> many a times, they, they say, okay, you can't prove the Prophet, therefore there's no God and there's no religion. These have nothing to do with each other, uh, these, these subjects, right? And so to, uh, to bring it back to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and God clearly is wise. Look at the look at everything around you. Clearly is purposeful, or else He wouldn't have endowed His creation with purpose. So, what is our purpose? Is it wise to create us and not give us purpose, or not communicate that purpose to us? So, where is the communication? This is very important. You know, one of the beautiful stories uh, I heard in this regard, and just you mentioned Aisha the Law on Sheikh Al Sulaiman. Of course, many of you probably know Yaqeen Institute. Hopefully, this is not like shameless plug. Uh, but they work to uh, to address these uh, head on in different ways, right? Dismantling that as a part of that, cultivating conviction is another that I'm more invested in for reasons I just mentioned. But these are all different ways to approach that. But the story he mentioned that after he gave a talk at uh, some southern, I believe, uh, university somewhere, uh, he was told that I agree with everything in Islam except the marriage to Aisha, uh, radiallahu anha. This is just, I cannot wrap my head around it. And so he refused to engage her in that conversation. He said to her, okay, point taken. Let's not jump there. What do you know about Aisha besides her age? And beautifully, I mean, the clip might be around. I, it was, uh, anyway, it, it is around. Uh, I, I remember being in attendance when, when he was mentioning it at Ikna. And basically, at the end of this story, when he realized, who, she realized, and learned who Aisha radiallahu anha was, that question became nonsensical to her. She didn't even need an answer for it anymore. Uh, the, she got to a point where there must be an explanation. Uh, because I can't, even if I don't have an answer to this, there are bigger questions that arise regarding how in the world is not a prophet. How in the world did God just leave us like this? You know, how in the world is she such a, a, an amazing uh, figure that contributed to the legacy of this ummah so much and so on and so forth. So ultimately, she, when she learned about who Aisha Allah Anha was, not right. only did she become Muslim, but she actually she named her first daughter Aisha. Uh, Allah. Anha. That's beautiful. And so the same thing, when someone has an issue with the Prophet himself, knowing who he is, puts him at a place where, okay, it's other stuff, there must be another explanation to it, because you are, you've are you worked past coming to the table with what they call a hermeneutic of suspicion, right? Like, yeah. you're Pre reading everything Pre in the worst positive light. Uh, and so that's what you want to do. You want to reframe the conversation uh, to build from the ground up so you're systematic in how you're able to analyze things, because, yeah. you know, interpreting something is an extension of uh, conceptualizing it. And so Absolutely. to develop a concept that's base. Is how you get people to the proper. Uh... 
evaluation of uh, you know the end uh, the end item that list. Yeah, and pre-framing of the process. Of the and pre-framing. And pre-framing the process is something that continues to happen. You know, um, I, this comes to my um, how Hamza Zord says, who uh, you know we all may know. He coined it very well, and he said, you know, um, for such uh, folks who who perceive the Prophet Sallam in such uh, a native light, you know, for them to wearing a uh, red lens in a sense, right? They don't have the same lens that we do. So if you if you if they were to be um, informed of the Prophet Sallam for who he truly was, because they don't know the Prophet Sallam, right? They don't know him. And if they were to know him for who he was, lifestyle, his hero, his biographies, uh, his actions, and so on then knowing the person would rid of the misconceptions automatically. Just like he mentioned, uh, the sister didn't need an answer for the Aisha contention. It just ultimately made sense because she came to learn about who the Prophet was. And I'll get a little personal with this and move on. Uh, so for me, as some of you may know, I was a former agnostic in my early life. A lot of people don't know that about me. My story is up online. But I had my own I had my own doubts in the past. And some of these issues I tackled with as well, probably why I'm involved in Dawah. Uh, in the manner that I am today, uh, to rid of such conceptions, uh, to some of which I held myself. But um, I held a very uh, theophilosophical position or a paradigm in how I evaluated prophets and uh, truth in general. And so what really stuck to me um, was the argument from C.S. Lewis, who some of you may have heard of, but he wrote about Jesus, right, for instance, and he wrote about how Jesus can either be a liar, a lunatic, or what have you. So if you apply that to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi uh, you know, Billah, he was either a liar, he was deluded, or he spoke the truth. He surely wasn't a, a liar because he was Sith al as everyone uh, admitted to by their own admission, right? Even his own enemies uh, in Quraysh. And of course, he wasn't deluded because of all the prophecies that he made and were fulfilled. None of them have been false eyed. And thus, deductively, he spoke the truth. And for me, that really um, made sense. You know, it was sensical and it was conceivable. And so there um, is no way to falsify that and also um, in relation to the Quran, the falsification test and the inimitability challenges and everything, all of that just kind of came together. So I'm looking at this from the angle of um, our general youth out there and our general um, Muslim community and hopefully, um, you know, dealing with these issues and making Islam available to them. And we can do that um, by, you know, working with such organizations as we do, being involved in Dawa. Dawa, uh, as Sheikh Shinawi mentioned, is uh, it's a fard, whether you conceive that it's a fard kifaya or a fard dying, it is something we should all be involved in some level or degree. Inshallah, we have a question. And so, with that, inshallah, we have some questions. Uh, Abu Sumayya, inshallah, I want to take that on. No, so we have a question that came forward, inshallah. How can you respond to those that say Jesus was more influential than Muhammad because there are more Christians than Muslims in the world today? There are more Christians. There are more Christians in this world. Um, but are we talking about practicing Christians versus practicing Muslims? Just it's Christian. Out the table. It can, yeah. can, I, I would like to say that this mm -hmm. it's not a competition. Uh, you know, we love all the prophets, and Subhanallah, this is uh, the, the Prophet Sallallahu himself loved Isa Alayhi uh, that was, you know, his his brother, his his soul, you know, the soulmates from Jannah who were sent down to us. So, uh, this is a facetious question. Uh, the original Christians were Muslims, you know. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, I feel like this is something that is. It's not. I, I don't think it's a competition. These are all beloved messenger of God, and uh, we love them. Yeah. Uh, both and. Uh, they love each That's other. A good point. I want uh, the other speakers to talk on this. It's very important. But, you know, um, and when it comes to logical reasoning, uh, this is a valid logical argument. It's called uh, an appeal to popularity, a populum mm -hmm. specifically. So an populum argument doesn't, doesn't necessarily entail truth. And in that regard, you know, see um, Isa as a beloved and mighty messenger uh, in Islam. Um, as the sister mentioned, uh, Sheikh Shinawi, I'm mindful of Muslim. Please chime in on this very important question. So she was a former Christian, so I, I'd prefer her to take this. <laughs> no, I'm serious. It's a good point. 
Uh, one who read the Bible six hours a day too. Yeah, uh, so, sir. Um, just I fear. I think you might. Oh, that's right. Muted. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Um, how slick. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, um, it's funny because uh, one person went to uh, one of our mams in uh, in Brooklyn, and they were asking him about this. Like, you know, why do you guys love this one and this one and more and more? And he said, Lynn, they're they're all. On the, they're all like 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 the sister said they all they love each other, and the, and at the end the reason we we talk about Rasulullah you know, more is because he completed right. it all. And if you take him, you take all the prophets before him. It's like a full pocket. But they all are there, very present in their own way. He's just like he's just mentioning the whole story. Subhanallah. So alhamdulillah, like you know, at the end of the day, like the sister said, it's not a competition, and it's not. And I mean, the history was just so vast. So many things have happened back and forth. And I agree. Like if you look at it from the perspective of like, are they really Christian and Muslims or you know, Subhanallah? So I, at the end of the day, I I do agree. We we can't look at it in such an arbitrary way. So Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. I'd rather you talk about it, Sheikh, because honestly, I want to hear what you have to say for this one. No, I'm going to let Wesley talk about it for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a coffee house conversation. We can just no, go around the room, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, I, I can look at it the same way. I don't look at it in terms of influence, in terms of counting numbers, inshallah. Ta'ala. I always tell people, inshallah, ta'ala, gauge the truth by the truth itself, right? Get the revelation, look at text. And if you look at the revelation and you look at the text, both Bible and Quran, as I tell people often, my story was a story of the Bible bringing me to Islam. So when I read the Bible, what I, it began to just justify the position that Islam was the truth for me. You know, I had Bible in hand, reading from the beginning to the end, and I'm just going crazy with my highlighter, and I come from a very religious family. People, you know, I have pastors throughout my entire family who have their own churches. I'm calling people, I'm calling family members, especially my grandmother. And, you know, and I'm asking all these questions. I'm seeing this in the Bible. You know, this is in the Bible. You know, what is the issue? What's going on? Why are we believing this way? And why are we doing this and doing that instead of what it says in the Bible? And I could never be given the answer, right? Um, and ultimately, the Bible finally led me to Islam, inshallah ta'ala, because those questions could not be answered except in the Quran itself. So, again, it's not an issue of how many people follow, you know, a specific individual or, mashallah, person or organization or faith, inshallah ta'ala. That doesn't mean that inshallah ta'ala there is success behind that right because sometimes you may have large numbers but success is not naturally um, um you know attached to large numbers inshallah ta'ala yeah so yeah. just think about this question just uh, i wanted to mention something you know michael h., uh michael a i think it's michael a um hart i believe his name is right he wrote a book on 100 most influential uh persons and the person that he deemed as number one interestingly as most influential was Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even to that very argument, you know, there is a sound response. Why? 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 um success and how he um has as many followers as he does in modern day time now while christianity you know there's a larger number by quantity it's not necessarily by practice muslims are known to be um those who follow um religion and implement it more on a mass scale on a larger level than christians because as you know i mean there's there's statistics interesting uh interestingly i think it was pew research who put forward that 50 percent of um, at least 50% of Christians say don't even know the name of the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. So I think that really says a lot. And of course, there are you know, a lot of Christians who don't attend to church and uh, simply are Christian by name, right? So sort of like a secular Christian um, model that they follow, you know, more traditional Christianity than it is orthodoxy. Right. I think that's very important. Maybe one of the... because. Uh, for me, the way I try to uh, think about da'wah is not about uh, necessarily, and I, I'm not against anything anyone has said, by the way. These are very useful answers. Uh, and I, I wouldn't even rank them as some stronger than others because, as I was about to say, da'wah is about what's the right answer for this person, right? How do I get past this person's defenses? That is the hikmah of da'wah. How do I sidestep someone's ego and have access to their heart? So that they'll actually hear it out for their own. Uh, and so maybe just to add a random one, not necessarily to, to climb up the list or anything, but one of the things that we would share is that we would deem it categorically incorrect, dismiss the message of Jesus Christ during his lifetime because the politics had smeared him and had him fugitive, right? 
would that disqualify his message? The fact that he had a very small following and they were fed to the lions at the end of the story and they were the first martyrs. And so uh, maybe uh, that would be a very unexpected response uh, to people that come with a mindset that Islam was founded by the Antichrist and you're now celebrating Christ and the followers of Christ and the, the struggle that we do believe Christ, peace be upon him, uh, faced at the hands of the, uh, the Roman Empire. When Allah knows best. Inshallah, uh, you have to uh, go on another strict uh, schedule. Um, I want to let you go. I know 8.30 was our cutoff time with you. If you can kind of give closing remarks, inshallah, one, one minute, two minutes, whatever you want to say, inshallah, before you start going, inshallah. I guess just double down on the, on the importance of the prophetic legacy, which is to share the message of God to the world, regardless of who's listening, knowing that this does strike a special chord inside of people that we may or may not notice, and we may or may not see the fruits of in our lifetime. You know, a lot of people, for example, now are, are totally consumed by the election conversation, and I don't want to be totally dismissive of electoral politics, but, you know, what is it that causes actual change on the ground? It is the hard work behind the scenes, right? What is it, you know, like Malcolm X, Rahmahullah, this personality, right, and his work on the ground, it never got to the ballots. If you guys remember the ballot or bullet uh, lecture, his work representing the commitment to justice in the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, and he continued refining it, you know, over and over until it was the true Islam, right? What did that do? We have an entire generation of Muslims now that were born out of that work that prophetic work of social justice, prophetic social justice. So likewise, you know, the prophetic message itself could have far greater, far-reaching impacts. Like, you don't know what investing in like, a media megaphone, you know, uh, uh, revving up something like this, why Islam does to produce, uh, forgive me, uh, uh, you know, uh, 5,000 Imam Wesleys and 5,000 mindful Muslims and 5,000 Mustafa Hijazis and... May my Allah bless and increase our sister Hina Zuberi and her line of work as well. And, and you just do this, you don't know what that could become. You know, every prophet, this sounds profound, I heard in, from one of my teachers in Medina. He said every prophet of God uh, was given certain gifts that no one else was given. You know, of the gifts of the prophet Muhammad and his legacy is that his da'wah was never repeated in any context except that it flourished when it was done properly. But you know, the ahadith that give you hope that even... Some prophets will come on the Day of Judgment with five, ten, five, two, or one follower. The, the sheikh was explaining this hadith and saying, but that is just as a matter of principle, because you may not see the followers. You may not see the product. But with Muhammad, if you read like an inductive read historically, it is never like this. Every time his da'wah arrives, it blossoms. And so may we be people that have far-reaching uh, effect and, and, and an imprint of, hey, of good on this world before we depart it and allow it to live for, for generations to come. Jazakallah khair for having everybody. Jazakallah khair for joining us. Thank you for being with us. Inshallah, brother Yasin, inshallah, inshallah, we'll go ahead and move on to the next uh, commercial break, inshallah. Bismillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. So, um, brothers and sisters, again, uh, the importance of donating to Why Islam, an organization that is highly involved in Dao, as you saw tonight, there's a lot of issues out there that still exist, and um, this is part of our deen to be involved in Dawa. As Allah Ta'ala says, They invite people um, or people to the way of your Lord of wisdom and beautiful preaching and reason with them in a manner that's best. So to be involved in that, this kind of work is truly an honor. And if you're not able to join us on the field, if you're not able 
to be, for example, a, a hotline volunteer, for instance, then surely you can donate donate to this cause. Um, again, placing billboards all around the country is something that leads people to call in and ask questions about Islam, which ultimately leads them to perhaps accepting Islam or just having their uh, questions answered and misconceptions rid of. Um, um, if you want to sponsor Dawa Boots, that's also an option. Uh, we have availabilities, uh, packages available, that is, for uh, new shahada packages. They're really interesting because when a person accepts Islam, I mean, that's just like the first phase, isn't it, right? So, the pre yeah, right. <laughs> there's a pre-shahada phase and there's a post-shahada phase. Um, it's, common, it's common thought that uh, the post-shahada phase is the more difficult one and the one that requires more support, essentially which is something that we would like to talk about, inshallah, today before we end. Um, but reverts need support. Who are going to support such reverts? Well, um, you know, there are organizations, sub-organizations like ICNA, like Embrace and others who work in this regard, but without them having that home feeling or that familial sense or that um, sense of education or resources available to them, they're often lost or discouraged, right? They have nothing to um to go with further um essentially and so this is an issue so you can sponsor uh shahada packages are only 50 dollars. so imagine if you purchase like 10 of them here you're giving 10 new muslims shahada packages which includes a quran it includes a prayer rug you know it includes booklets um how to pray and all the fundamentals all the teachings of the process how to go about and start their uh journey essentially and don't forget and don't forget, every time they make a salah because they learned how to play from that booklet that they received from you, you yeah. are putting it down as if they had, as if you have, as if a uh, prayer on your skin as well. So five times a day they pray, those are five salawat additional to your five every single day, inshallah. Don't forget that. Every time yeah. they learn how to go ahead and tahajjud and qiyamu layl and mashallah standing up during the month of Ramadan, all of that is going on your skin because mashallah is you aided in providing them with the resource yeah. to learn how to pray, to learn how to make wudu, and the, and the likes, inshallah. And essentially, that can be Salah Jariya. That can be Salah Jariya as well. You know, and it always comes to mind, um, the story, and, and, and not specific story, this this actually happened to me that I've encountered. Um, many brothers and sisters, or we brothers and sisters, told me the same exact story, that it was just one pamphlet, subhanAllah, one pamphlet that led them to Islam. And I want to, without names, but I can, you know, uh, off the top of my head, I can name at least five or six brothers and sisters top of my head who literally were guided by a single pamphlet whether it was a pamphlet about the hijab whether it was a pamphlet about the concept of god whether it was a pamphlet about prophet Muhammad, you know pamphlets are really cheap um actually but to purchase them uh you know in bulk um becomes pricey so that's also an area where you can invest inshallah and of course you're investing the dunya and the akhirah Brothers and sisters, I mean, donating a few dollars won't hurt, you know, alhamdulillah. And risk is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all we need to do is do our due diligence. These organizations need to continue to grow. These these organizations need to continue to uh, go on with their work. Because look at it this way. If we don't convey the message of Islam, who will? There are no more prophets and messengers to come. So the propagation of the deen, the conveying of the message, I think of it as a conveyor belt, right? You go to an airport, you see a conveyor belt, right? Um, with that said, you know, consider that ideology, right? You are essentially part of that conveyor belt. You can be a part of that conveyor belt. You need to take that conveyor belt, go though, and um, carry those resources and deliver them, inshallah. So if you're not able to join us on the field, which you can do, by the way, there are, um, mashallah, a lot of opportunities out there. Simply just email us at info at ysm.org. Okay, info at ysm.org. If you want to join us on, on the field and give da'wah and communicate with Muslims directly, you're more than welcome. You know, you want to volunteer for the hotline, you're more than welcome to submit an application. You'll be reviewed, you know, um, screen. Inshallah, if you're good, then you can definitely join us on there as well. There's a lot of work, a lot of da'wah, a lot of da'wah opportunities. Please do join the efforts and reap the rewards. Yeah, we need people in English and Spanish, inshallah. Ta'ala. Si hablan español, te necesitamos, inshallah. Ta'ala. Absolutamente, inshallah. Ta'ala. So, right. speak English and Spanish. Well, we, <laughs> we can follow up. <laughs> we need that work being done on both, on both ends, inshallah. Ta'ala. Let's move on, inshallah, to the last segment, uh, sisters, inshallah. Ta'ala. Living the legacy in terms of the ideal role model 
for men and for women, inshallah. So mindful Muslim, I'll start with you. Although the Prophet was man, can Muslim women still take the Prophet وسلم, as an ideal role model? And if so, how does that look, inshallah, for those who don't know? Yeah. Well, you know, the Prophet he was a mercy to mankind. And alhamdulillah, that is involving us. And it was never said that it is not, you know, of us as well. And so alhamdulillah, I think what, what I learned to do is when I, like I said at the beginning, when you learn about who the Prophet peace upon him was and you need to love him, you see how much your life not just changes for yourself, but for everyone around you. And so subhanAllah, when I think about being the best wife, being the best mother, being the best neighbor, being the best everything, the first thing I do is always ask, how did he do it? So for example, I just moved into a neighborhood just recently. And the first thing I did, and actually I've done this in the past three houses, um, once I had learned that that um, the way that the Prophet peace upon him did things, and I would go instantly and buy gifts and I would give them to our neighbors and we would just and even especially whenever they had issues going on with their families we would knock on the door and we would deliver them things and my Jews were people they would peer out the window through the blinds like who's Muslims coming in the neighborhood but I taught all of my children I have five kids alhamdulillah when you come into a space don't wait for people to approach you you need to come and show that I am a servant of the people around me and to give that, to teach them what Islam is by your actions. So when I think of the Prophet, peace upon him, I think about what type of neighbor I want to be. I think of what type of mom and all these things. Mm -hmm. So for me, it has brought this immense peace in my life and um, it has helped to create better relationships around me. So I always learn how he was and I try to do it myself in living and breathing form and then teach it to my children. So a problem I see here a lot of times is uh, neo-feminism or just feminism in general, right? <laughs> Femme often will say, um, sisters, why are you guys following a man, right? Why are you following, especially this guy, right? So Sister Hina, how would you do with that? SubhanAllah. So then they don't understand Muslims. You know, uh, SubhanAllah. Um, this body is, you know, we are a soul with a body. We're not a body with a soul. Uh, this, you know, and in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all our souls are, uh, in, in that sense, all equal, right? Um, and to follow the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the greatest gift of my life as a woman. He teaches men how to be men and women how to be women. And subhanAllah, any one of us out there who are looking for role models, looking in this world, because this world is seriously messed up. And when in his in his life in his like look at this one you know i was just looking uh, thinking about justice and you know we do a lot of justice work all the time and the establishment of qist and fairness and that is you know one of my day jobs my life mission is to i believe the establishment of qist in the world um and uh, i remember this story um of it's narrated by sufyan ibn umayyah he said i was sleeping in the mosque and um, a thief came and stole my cloak and then he snatched it from my head and i woke up and i shouted after him and they caught the man and then i brought him before the prophet وسلم, and you know who ordered the had the punishment to be carried out and at that time he felt bad and then he said oh will they do something, you know, like cut off his hand for something for just 30 bucks, you know, 30 dirhams. Uh, why don't I just sell him the cloak? And even if he can't pay me now, he can pay me over time. And then the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and said, why did you not bring so, why did you not do so before bringing him to me? Right? So that, like that universal message of justice that to pardon the offender before reporting them to the authorities, right? And, and reporting them to whatever the law can be, because law may be, you know, especially living in this country, the law may be unjust. Um, that enables the offender to amend, make tawbah, to regret, you know, finish, you know to regret his, his behavior, her behavior, repent from the sin. This is such a universal uh, teaching. That so what about uh, those who, for instance, say, well, you know, the, your prophet also taught, um, that women are less than men, you know, why take this guy's role model? Women are subjugated and oppressed in Islam and so on. So how do you deal with that allegation? Uh, Mindful Muslim and Hin, uh, Sister Hina, uh, both of you inshallah can chime in since you're sisters. We're just the brothers, you know, let's just sit back, you know, let the sisters take over. Inshallah. We need response from the sisters in this segment. 
Well, I let you first, sister. Go ahead. You were doing such a great job. <laughs> well, I say this to this. The Prophet Sallallahu did not say anything that the Creator did not tell him to say. So anything that the Prophet Sallallahu said was from our Creator. And if my Creator, know, my Creator knows me more than the world because he created me, you know? So at that point, it's a moot point to me how Allah, when I go back to my Rabb and I know my Rabb is the most just, and if he put this man as the mercy to mankind and womankind, as a leader for us to follow, it is because my, my Rabb knows best, right? So if I believe in my Rabb, I will believe in everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down, including the fact that this man is our leader. So I, that's what I meant when I said in the beginning, if you are asking these questions, you do not understand Islam. You do not understand the role of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. And because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the role of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our lives. Uh, real quick, uh, my friend, before you answer, Remember, Samaya, with the Hispanic Dawah Department in Why Islam, do you ever encounter such questions uh, from, let's say, the Latino world in your tradition? Uh, does this come, come often, you know, like, why are you guys following the Prophet, uh, specifically in relation to woman issues and what have you? You know, honestly, nowhere near as it is done in the English side. Most of our questions are related to Jesus. We love Jesus. <laughs> we go. Right. You know what I mean? And I, and, and, and I don't know, you know, I'll be for front, right? And now we still have a revolution. Yeah, do you know what's real? We have a revolutionary type of culture where man plays mm. very strong and I'm the man, right? It's changed nowadays, right? But if you talk about my, my father's generation, my grandparents' generation, the man was the man, the woman was the woman. There was you no know, intersection between those two, right? They played two separate roles. So kind of, you know, now the new changing generation, we'll see if the trend kind of changes. Right. Um, coming forward. Uh, but as of yet, we really don't get that many um, questions on that level. Um, yeah, it's more like, I guess, Western culture as opposed to Hispanic and even Arab culture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm full of some, please, Shal. Um, You know, what I would think is, first of all, I used to have these conversations with women about 10 years ago. It's actually a lot easier for conversation than now. Like, as more time passes and feminism and all that, it gets just bigger and bigger and more ingrained in our society. If you even say for one second you're against feminism as a Muslim, they instantly write, turn her off. She's just not one of us. It's extremely abrasive, the whole environment, to be honest. But there was one really, really amazing resource that I read. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, right at the beginning, Allah put me with, like, best of people. And I remember I read a paper by Jamel Bedi uh, called Equity versus Equality. And as soon as that whole concept was introduced to me, equity versus equality, I realized that equity, um, no pun intended, Trump equality. So the minute I chose equality and feminism and love, it was just like, it was like going from Alexa to Hoopty, or what you want to say? <laughs> like, you know, like, why would I want to even go there? It's just, no. And then there's this beautiful picture. I wish I could flip it up on the screen. Um, as an educator, we now know that equality is actually not good for everyone because it doesn't serve everyone. I know what everyone. picture so you're talking about. Is it like the two people right? standing up and one is like... With the fence. Yes. Yeah, there was like, there's like children of different sizes. I think one was an elephant, one was yeah. a fish. And it's like if you gave them all the same, you know, m means to, to, get, to get educated or to see or to reach, it wouldn't really work out because you're not really meeting their individual needs. So it's it just would only work under equity, wouldn't it? Yes, exactly. Right. So Which is we need world. to teach that. We need to teach equity. And then they would just like be like, oh, what is that feminism thing? <laughs> what is that? We don't need it. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention that point um, on gender um, equity versus um, equality because, you know, gender equity is a higher level of equality or equalness in a sense. It's sort of like the firefighter example. I don't know if you ever heard of this one, um, I from Muslim and others, you know. Okay, fine. Yeah, you can have a female firefighter. It's not a problem. You can train her and what have you. But if you look at firefighters statistically today, I mean, look at any culture, whether it's Western culture, you know, Eastern culture, you name it. What makes up the majority of firefighters today? Males. And that's only because of their biological figure, right? They're just more equipped, generally speaking. They're more built for it. So it's all about equity, right? Women, for example, may be um, better in many other things, right? Their memory, uh, statistics show and research show, they may have greater memory than men in many other things, right? Uh, and, and basically, equity is about placing the strengths of each gender and utilizing it 
to ultimately reach equality. So that's the difference kind of between gender equity and equality. And from that sense, I think there is a valid uh, premise here as to how both men and women can take the Prophet Sallam as a role model because he carved that path to see gender equity for both you know, men and women in regards to their biological state, in regards to the mental capacity, and so on and so on. Brother Muslim, I just add one last thing. When you, when, when we don't talk about is once women get equality, quote unquote, I was a career woman, I was also a single mother. So once you get to be in the workforce and you get to be like a man, you get to do all that stuff, there's a lot of other things that then slip out of play because the mother is not present in the home. Believe me, if you ask the average, even Western woman, the guilt that they have for not being present with their children because they're outside working so much and the things they've missed and issues, there's a whole, everything kind of gets offset. So no one's talking about the effects of that. So I think if we have a whole picture, it's yeah. not, like I said, it's, yeah, it's basically against their fitra, ultimately. And um, men have a certain fitra, women have a certain fitra. And there's overlap. You know, it's not to say that there is an overlap. Um, but ultimately, you know. I, th I, think, I think that's why, too, the scholars, mashallah, they so beautifully have stated regarding the woman that she is all of society, right? She is the mother, she is the, mother she is the grandmother. She That without the mother, basically, subhanAllah, you know, society wouldn't be reared and wouldn't be educated and wouldn't move forward the way we move forward, right? SubhanAllah, so showing, mashallah, the very, mashallah, high position that women actually hold within the faith of Islam, inshallah ta'ala. I want to remind everybody, don't forget, inshallah ta'ala, donate, inshallah ta'ala, whyislam.org forward slash donate. Sister Hina wanted to add a point to that. Yes, I wanted to say, and, and you know, uh, for women, there we have so many roles Motherhood, yes, but there's so many other roles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us for that we're just better at communicate honestly. Uh, I've been working, communications, organizing, just getting, you know, stuff done without like all that. I leave out those conversations we and we just make our role into just motherhood uh we we the wisdom of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we lose out on a lot of that another thing that i do want to say uh this when we put all the put each other in boxes right i spoke at the women's march um in washington dc in front of thousands of people and people would immediately put me under in a feminism box right or they mm. will put me if I do not choose to be in those spaces, they will put me in a box that I do not believe in the rights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given women. I believe in using every platform that is offered and putting the da'wah out there, right? So when that pl platform was offered, to go on there and then say what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to say. So this is something that I do want to, like as we're talking about da'wah and using every media possible, um, this is something that I can believe in. You know, Maya, I have a quick question for you. I'm glad you, you, know, know, glad you stressed that point, Sister Hena, because I think maybe a lot of people mistaken that issue, right? Where they say, well, why would you go there? Why would you do that? Right? And I always, like, like, like what you mentioned, I always remind them the same thing. Well, the platform was open for me. They didn't write my script for me. I'm not reading something that my father told me. I, they allowed me to come and use their platform to talk to their crowd and to their people about whatever I wanted to talk about. And I think that that's amazing, inshallah ta'ala, and I hope that we continue to use those things. Yeah, Imam Osmai, a quick question for you. Um, why Islam? Do we have any material, both in English and Spanish, on women issues, um, you know, dispelling misconceptions and just giving accurate information about this topic? We do. We have a pamphlet on, on the rights of women, if I'm not mistaken, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and mashallah, there's both in English and Spanish, inshallah ta'ala. So you can go to our website, yislam.org, inshallah ta'ala. And mashallah, you can actually ask to have that pamphlet sent free to you, inshallah ta'ala, with no charge, inshallah ta'ala, along with the Quran. Absolutely. Well, this is so important, and I believe that, uh, it was, it's a Islam poster. I remember uh, that used to be hung on our Sunday school wall in, you know, and so many young girls that saw that poster walked away feeling like, oh, my mom never talked about that, but I read that poster and it made me feel better about being a Muslim woman. So it's, it's so- It's about the one with the hijabs, they all wear the same reason, that one or a different um, one? I, I, I remember it was a woman in hijab, uh, it was on a green background, but that's, that you know, so that that's what I remember, but that was, 
I've seen these uh, pamphlets and these posters in action, even within the Muslim community. A lot of times we think we're just giving doubt to non-Muslims. Our young people, Allah has so much misinformation. And so when they get authentic information, it's so important. This is why. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, this is why like, we just recently launched a Muslim uh, TV channel called Muslim Network TV. It's America's only Muslim channel. And this was the precise reason. Like, people were like, why would you invest in a Muslim channel at this point? But this is the exact time now. Our children have nothing to look at. Um, at this, you know, so it's so, so important to have uh, to be giving dawah to our own community as well as to the broader community. Absolutely. And, and that's why we need to re invest in these different resources, right? Because I often tell people, if you don't like what you see, then change it, right? If you don't like what you see, then change it. Be part of changing, you know, I me mean, what you don't like to see. We often say our kids don't have anything, we don't have anything, you know, it's not, and then our kids say Islam is boring, Islam is like this is too strict, right? But what have we created, inshallah, mm -hmm. to change that narrative and things like this are very important. And based on that, I wanted to, Ask one last quick question. We have about five minutes left, inshallah ta'ala, in the time. Um, Sister uh, Mindful Muslim, inshallah ta'ala, you spoke about, inshallah, which inshallah I love. You moving into a new neighborhood, inshallah ta'ala, I've experienced this with another brother. I used to live in Illinois. And inshallah, you know, handing out gifts and, you know, introducing yourself to your neighbors. This particular video, we go barbecue and have everybody on the front lawn. Everybody would come and be invited, inshallah ta'ala. And it reminded me of the ayat in the Quran, wa man ahsanu qawla min man da'a ila who is better is peace than one who invites to Allah, does righteous deeds, but then follows all of that by saying, indeed, I'm Muslim. How important is it for us to disconnect our actions from, mashallah, my mother gave me good manners, right? Mashallah, I got brought up in a, in, a, in a wonderful household with good morals and characteristics and traits, and really pushing out to the front. This is what my deen, my Quran, my sunnah of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teach me. Um, I think it comes really with that self-confidence and self-esteem yourself. Because when I talk to a lot of them all the time, especially with hijab, right? It's a very visual thing. And like, why can't you do it? Why can't you just say I'm Muslim? How many of us, we can't actually say it in public at our jobs? Or like, you know, men are saying their names. And like, why can't you just say it? If you get down to it, it's just we just really care too much about what other people think. We just really care too much. And we think like, you know, will they like me? Will they not like me? Will I offend them? We care so much about people more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And offending Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and about about whether they're gonna like us or not. So I think as soon as we stop getting caught up in all that, and we think of like what are my morals, what are my non-negotiables, like what am I grounded in, and then actually stand for that. I think it wasn't until I was 30, I'll be totally honest, as a female, where I felt so comfortable in my skin, I literally didn't care. I was like, I know Allah is so good to me. I can't betray him by pretending somebody else gifted me all of this barakah that I have. So as soon as I got really real with that with myself and I stopped caring about people and what they think, it was so easy. It rolled off my tongue so much. So I think, you know, really, really connecting with that. So then anything to add? Yeah, I, I'll just give a small example. You know, like how after you're done shopping and you roll that card back and you put it back and usually the guy who's collecting the carts but in the cold rain, they're so grateful and they always say thank you. I always make it a point, not only for myself or all my kids, to let them know, oh, it's I'm doing this because I'm Muslim. It's just a small little thing. Why? Why are we returning that amana off that grocery store back to them? Um, yes, it's good manners, but it's more. It's because we're doing this because our dean taught us to do this. And it's so important to connect these little things that we do on a daily basis because they make up our life. They make up the way we do things. You know, just as you said, greeting your neighbors, being there for them, um, you know, shoveling someone else's uh, driveway because you're Muslim and not just because, oh, I'm such a nice person. Um, this is an absolute, I, I believe, a a foundation of doubt that we need to, and makes it easy for us to live our Islam. I agree, Sister yeah. Hina. I think we should save that to our children within the house first. I always yeah. say to my kids, you know why? Because we're Muslim, and mm. we have to instill that in them as well. So when they go out, it's as easy for them, alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. May Allah reward you both, MashaAllah. We have two minutes left, inshallah ta'ala, before the hour, before ending, inshallah ta'ala. I want to give each one of you, inshallah ta'ala, a very brief um, moment to go ahead and just, if you have any closing words, inshallah ta'ala, before we close up, inshallah. Sister Hina, we begin with you. 
I just want to say, subhanAllah, the work why Islam does is absolutely important. I see it daily when I go out on the street, when I, if you're at a fair, if you're at the local city council meeting, if you're at Congress, anywhere, if you live in this, in this country, you have an obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you today in this time and space in 2020 under the Trump administration for a reason. No, nothing is by chance. And by supporting the work of white Islam, you are doing that. If you cannot do it, at least you're enabling all these brothers and sisters to do the work that is incumbent upon us as we live in this land. Jazakallah khair. Sister yeah, and piggybacking off of what the sister said, I mean, not all of us say we don't have time, right? We're so busy, my schedule's so packed, I really can't get out there and do that. Okay, but to put money towards a pamphlet that could go towards, so like, look at us, for example, so many of us on the panel mentioned, like, okay, we, we made jihad, and then we went off and did amazing things, or alhamdulillah, other people, you know, subhanAllah, they went off, and Sheikh Yusuf, subhanAllah, Estes, went off and did amazing things, and how many people he touched? Maybe with that one pamphlet, it just was all of that. So you never know, if you don't have time, you still invest the money, because even while you're you're sleeping. It's just coming in. And the last thing I will say is that subhanAllah, um, you know, many of us think that, okay, 401k and all these things invest, invest in the dunya. The amount of time that we're going to spend in the akhra and the amount of time that we don't invest in our bank account there, we want to come and show up. It's empty. SubhanAllah. So this is actually a gift. Having Islam come to me is a gift to me to give me an opportunity to do something not just for the entire community, but even for myself in, in, in the day of Yom al with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, give as much as you can because Allah only multiplies in magnitude, subhanAllah. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, you know, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all and for joining this platform. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put our words into actions and to guide us all together. The work of Dawah is crucial. It's important in a post-Trump, post-9-11 Islamophobic era, which still um, continues uh, during the pandemic as we have it today. Alhamdulillah, things, um, there is, mashallah. Uh, light at the end of the tunnel, as they say, and there is a lot of positivity out there. A lot of people who do support Islam and Muslims and people interested in wanting to learn more about Islam and its theological aspect and in general, and just really wanting to know uh, Islam for what it is from a sincere, kind of genuine perspective. And uh, for such people, we want to make Islam available, and even for such antagonism, people who dislike Islam, we also want to make Islam available to them because they, as the speakers have demonstrated today, are just misinformed and don't know. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you can see this behind me. Maybe I got to go this way. You deserve to know. Everybody deserves to know. Everybody deserves a message. We have went on road trips, brothers and sisters, just conveying the message of Islam, um, maybe in total over 22 states in the U.S. You know, we went to the, to the South. Um, you know, we visit all kinds of people, the alternate walks of life. And I'll tell you, um, in general, people are very personable and willing to have that conversation. The question is, are we going to be involved in facilitating that conversation and making it happen? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all the donors uh, tonight and those involved and those who um, viewed this program and supported it. And we also, we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless all the speakers, Sister Mindful Muslima, uh, Sister Hina Zubaydi, Sheikh Shinnawi, and my dear brother, Imam Abu Samaya. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. I would just add, inshallah, ta'ala, brothers and sisters, do not forget, please do not forget that Islam is a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon you. He has showered you with it. He has illuminated your life with it. Mashallah, he has brought pleasure in terms of your family, in terms of your wealth, in terms of where you live, in terms of your spirituality, in terms of your heart, in terms of your soul, in terms of your mind. This is what Islam did for me personally 23 years ago, alhamdulillah. It brought me out of darkness, as Allah says, it took me out of the darkness of this belief, out of the darkness of misguidance, and it brought me to the light of belief and faith. I was a person of no faith, alhamdulillah, and Islam gave me that faith and instilled, Allah instilled that faith in my heart because someone cared to deliver that message to me, inshallah ta'ala. And this is what you're investing in, inshallah ta'ala. You are investing in humans, hearts, minds, and souls. This is the work that we do. We're investing in hearts, minds, and souls, inshallah ta'ala. And as Brother Mustafa has said, not only are we going out to the local city, you know, downtown area to give dawah, 
not only, mashallah, do we give classes here and there, but we show up even in moments or at events that are extremely large. As Sister Hannah mentioned, we've been to Brazil during the World Cup. I can tell you we gave all out over 20,000 pamphlets in Brazil. I've never seen so many people want pamphlets. We would give a pamphlet and somebody standing looking at me like, what about mine? And like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> as well. you know, this the Super Bowl is awesome. This would be on the trains, right? Exactly. I've been to Ecuador, subhanAllah. I've been to Guatemala. I've been to Puerto Rico. I've been to the Super Bowl. Alhamdulillah, we've been to events where thousands upon thousands of people, alhamdulillah, and mashallah, the engagement that we get is incredible and amazing. And this is what you're investing in, inshallah. Continue to invest in hearts, minds, and souls, and be doing the work of the prophets. And we thank you all for partaking. Don't forget, donate at yislam.org for slash donate. And we still have our lines open and available. One eight seven seven Y Islam. If you want to call in person and make that donation, inshallah. Ta'ala. And we end by saying, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And may the peace and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon you all. And just hold fast so that you can see one last um, commercial, inshallah. Ta'ala. Jazakallah khair and sisters being with us. And may Allah reward you and place it on yourselves. Jazakallah khair and jamiyan. Since 1998, Y-Islam has grown to become one of the world's leading educational resources on authentic Islam. Y-Islam has developed several programs that provide accurate information about Islam while dispelling misconceptions and stereotypes. Over 10,000 hotline calls, 1.3 million annual visits to the Y-Islam website, 500,000 likes on Facebook, 100,000 YouTube subscribers, 16.5 million views on YouTube, more than 300 shahadas a year, 20,000 free Qur'ans distributed, 500,000 brochures, information in multiple languages, hundreds of dawah booths and billboards across 50 cities. Tired of hearing stereotypes about Islam? Do your part in fighting Islamophobia. Donate today. Allah.